Hello class, welcome to Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured. This is Chapter 8 where we'll be discussing vehicle extrication and special types of rescue that you might be involved in. When it comes to the National EMS Education Standards competencies, what we're going to be talking about is EMS operations, which means knowledge of operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personnel safety. When it comes to specifically vehicle extrication, the goal is for safe vehicle extrication and use of simple hand tools. You will usually not be responsible for rescue, but you may assist with extrication. Rescue involves many different processes and environments and rescue requires training beyond the EMT level. This chapter covers the basic concepts of extrication so that you can function effectively as a team during a rescue incident. First and foremost is safety. An extrication requires mental and physical preparation. Priority is to provide patient care, but utmost priority is your personal safety and that of your team, and it must be placed before patient care, and that is initiated before patient care is initiated. Safety begins with the proper mindset and proper personal and protective gear. The equipment that you use and the gear that you will wear depends on the hazards you expect to encounter as well as what you observe during your scene size up. Protective safety gear may include turnout gear, helmets, hearing protection, fire extinguisher, blood and fluid impermeable gloves, and leather gloves over disposable gloves. With vehicle safety systems, they can become hazards after a collision. For instance, shock absorbing bumpers may be compressed or loaded, quote unquote, following a front or rear end collision. So always approach vehicles from the side. Otherwise, they could release and injure your knees and legs. Manufacturers are required to install supplemental restraints or airbags in all new cars. And airbags fill with a non-harmful gas on impact and quickly deflate after the crash. Airbags are located in the steering wheel and in the dash front side of the passenger. There are also side impact airbags that may be located in doors or seats. And airbags should be deployed and deflated before you arrive but there may be non-deployed airbags that spontaneously inflate as you provide patient care. So maintain at least a five inch clearance around side impact airbags that have not deployed. Maintain at least a 10 inch clearance around driver's side airbags that have not deployed. Maintain at least 20 inch clearance around passenger side airbags that have not deployed. Inside vehicles, there can be haze where the airbags have deployed and it's caused by cornstarch or talc. This is used to prevent minor skin irritations by reducing the friction between the occupant's skin and the airbags. Appropriate protective gear, including eye protection, will reduce the risk of eye or lung irritation from this substance. The fundamentals of extrication are this. Again, your primary concern is safety and your primary roles are to provide emergency medical care and prevent further injury to the patient. It also includes the fact that you may provide care as extrication is going on around you. Extrication is defined basically as the removal from entrapment or a dangerous situation or position. Entrapment is a condition in which a person is caught within a closed area with no way out or has a limb or other body part trapped. And in the context of this chapter, extrication means the removal of the patient from a wrecked vehicle. The table on this slide shows us the 10 phases of extrication. Make sure that you review these. This is in your text as well. This is table 38-1. And they are preparation, number two, en route to the scene, number three, arrival and scene size up, four, hazard control, five, support operations, six, gaining access, seven, emergency care, eight, removal of the patient, 
9, transfer of the patient, and 10, termination of the call once they're delivered to the hospital. EMS personnel are responsible for several things. Your roles and responsibilities are for assessing and providing medical care, triaging patching patients, and providing additional assessment and care as needed once patients are removed, providing transport to the emergency department. The rescue team is responsible for securing and stabilizing the vehicle and providing safe entrance and access to the patients and extricating any patients. Law enforcement officers are responsible for controlling traffic, maintaining order at the scene, and establishing and maintaining a perimeter. Firefighters are responsible for extinguishing fire, preventing additional ignition, ensuring that the scene is safe, removing spilled fuel, and roles and responsibilities can vary based upon jurisdiction and available agencies. Good communication among team members and clear leadership are essential to safe, efficient, proper provision of emergency care. As far as preparation is concerned, you need to remember that preparing for an incident requiring extrication involves pre-incident training with rescue personnel for the various types of rescue situations in which you might respond. Rescue personnel must routinely check the extrication tools and their response vehicles. Such preparations reduce the possibility of equipment failure at an emergency scene. When en route to the scene, procedures and safety precautions similar to those in the phases of an ambulance call are used when responding to a rescue incident. Arrival and scene size up. Make sure to position the ambulance to block the scene from oncoming traffic. Use only essential warning lights. Too many lights tend to distract and confuse motorists. And many emergency responders have been injured on scene when they were struck by passing vehicles. Choose a location to park allow, that allows safe access to the scene while leaving a way out. And do not park where you'll be blocked in by other emergency vehicles, etc. Also position your rig so that the back of the ambulance is pointing toward the scene to facilitate patient transport. At a hazardous materials incident, park uphill and upwind from the hazard. Put on PPE and look for passing cars before exiting your vehicle and do not assume that motorists will heed warning lights. Make sure the scene is properly marked and protected. Request assistance from law enforcement. They should help to ensure that the road is closed or traffic flow is diverted using cones, flares, or tape. Your job is to provide patient care, but you might be forced to direct traffic until other units arrive. Size up is an ongoing process of information and gathering scene evaluation to determine appropriate strategies and tactics to manage an emergency. Pay attention to downed electrical lines, leaking fluids, fire, and broken glass and it's important to identify any resources that are additional that may be needed. This may include additional EMS units or other public safety personnel. Situational awareness is the ability to recognize any possible issues and act proactively to avoid negative impact. You can evaluate hazards and determine number of patients by doing a 360 degree walk around the scene. Look for the following. Mechanism of injury, downed electrical lines, and leaking fluids or fuels. If there's smoke or fire at the incident, also look for broken glass, trapped or ejected patients, and the number of vehicles involved. And a word about ejected patients. Even though seatbelt laws are in place and most people comply with them, not everybody wears them. So your patient may be well away from the actual scene of the vehicle itself and there are situations where the seat belt hasn't been clasped properly and comes undone and the patient's ejected so make sure to look um, sometimes a fair distance away to make sure especially if you see any signs of evidence like the windshield being gone uh, for a patient that maybe have or maybe has been ejected from the vehicle while looking at the vehicle or vehicles, 
involved in a motor vehicle collision. Note the damage to the vehicles. Bent steering wheels may indicate significant face and or thoracic trauma. Imprints in the dashboard may indicate lower extremity injuries such as fractures and possible hips dislocations and fractures. Lift deployed airbags to see if there is deformity to the steering wheel or dashboard, which indicates the patient struck the structure after the airbag deflated. Unrestrained patients may have contact injuries such as secondary injuries, so check a windshield for spiderweb pattern of shattered glass that indicates possible head, face, or neck injuries. Include findings in your documentation and use this information to maintain a high index of suspicion. Evaluate the need for additional resources, such as extrication equipment, the fire department, law enforcement, hazmat unit, utility company, advanced life support units, or possibly air transport. Look for spilled fuels and other flammable substances, and sometimes post-crash fires are started when sparks ignite spilled fuel. An electrical short or damaged battery may also cause a post-crash fire. Rain, sleet, or snow can produce present an added hazard for rescue. Crashes that occur on hills are harder to handle than those that occur on level ground. It increases the potential for the vehicle to roll over and the vehicle requires stabilization prior to gaining access. Conditions for the crash may cause other motorists to lose control of their vehicles and injure you. And some crash scenes may present threats of violence. Intoxicated people or people who are upset may pose a threat to you or others. Also be alert for the possibility of weapons. Coordinate your efforts with rescue teams and law enforcement. Communicate with members of a rescue team throughout extrication. Start talking to the incident commander as soon as you arrive. You become a member of the rescue team and will enter the vehicle and provide care for patient or patients when approved by the incident commander. Now we're going to talk a bit about hazard control. Downed electrical lines are a common hazard at vehicle crash scenes. Never attempt to move downed electrical lines. If power lines are close to the vehicle involved in the crash, instruct the patient to remain in the vehicle until the power is shut off. Remain in the safe zone outside of the danger zone or hot zone. A hot zone is an, an area where individuals can be exposed to sharp metal edges, broken glass, toxic substances, radiation or explosion of hazardous materials. This is an example of hazard control and this is a car that's crashed into a power line. You should maintain at least 500 feet and it should be said also that power lines don't just spark and they're not just live. They can jump and move quite a length of distance uh, and injure other people. So main sh make sure that you uh, use a PA system, uh, alert the passenger to stay still in the motor vehicle until um, that hazard ha has been cleared by the proper personnel. Family members and bystanders can also create hazards, so the danger zone is off limits to bystanders and you should help set up and enforce this zone. The vehicle itself can also be a hazard. An unstable automobile on its side or roof can be a very great danger to you and rescue personnel can res uh, stabilize the car with a variety of jacks and cribbing. Ensure the car is in park with the parking brake set and the ignition turned off. Both battery cables should be disconnected negative side first, that's the black side, to minimize the possibility of sparks or fire. With alternative fuel vehicles they may be powered by electricity and electric electricity slash gasoline hybrids or fuels such as propane, natural gas, methanol, or hydrogen. One common feature is the need for responders to disconnect the battery to prevent further fire or explosion. In more than 40% of today's alternative fuel vehicles, the batteries are located in the trunk or under the seats, not in the engine compartment, and there may be more than one battery present. So it behooves you to learn a little bit about the cars that are on the road today. With hybrid vehicle systems, Hybrid batteries have a higher voltage than traditional automobile batteries. It may take up to 10 minutes for a high voltage system to de-energize after the main battery is turned off. 
avoid high voltage cables, typically orange, and their components. Damaged high voltage batteries may give off toxic fumes. Do not approach the vehicle if an unusual odor is detected and retreat if you experience any burning in your eyes or throat. Now let's talk about support operations. Support operations include lighting the scene, establishing tool and equipment staging areas, marking helicopter landing zones. Fire and rescue personnel will work together with you on these functions. Now let's talk about gaining access. Gaining access to the patient is a critical phase of the extrication. Make sure the vehicle is stable and hazards are eliminated or controlled. Check with the incident commander and enter the scene only after these conditions are met. The exact way to gain access to the patient depends on the situation. It's up to you to identify the safest and most efficient way to gain access. If there are multiple patients, you should locate and rapidly triage each patient to determine who needs urgent care. The figure on this slide shows the motor vehicle collision. The exact way to gain access depends on many factors, including terrain, the way in, the ve the way in which the vehicle is positioned, uh, etc. So make sure you scrutinize before gaining immediate access to identify hazards to you and your patient. To determine the exact location and position of the patient, consider the following questions. Is the patient in a vehicle or some other structure? Is the vehicle or structure severely damaged? What hazards exist that pose a risk to the patient and rescuer? In what position is the vehicle? On what type of surface? Is the vehicle stable or is it apt to roll or tip? As patients' conditions change, you may have to change your course of action. Rapid vehicle extrication may be needed to quickly remove a patient if the environment is threatening or if the patient needs cardiopulmonary resuscitation. CPR is not effective if the patient is sitting upright. In a rapid vehicle extrication, you and your team may have to move a patient from inside a vehicle to a supine position on a long backboard. A team of experienced EMTs should be able to perform rapid extrication in one minute or less. So between calls, this is a good skill to practice. During the access and extrication phases, make sure the patient remains safe. A heavy fire resistant blanket can be used to protect the patient from breaking glass, flying particles, tools, or other hazards. And a long, black, a long backboard may be used as a shield. Maintain good communication with the patient. Always describe what you're going to do before you do it and as you're doing it, even if you think the patient is unresponsive. Try to keep heat, noise, and force to a minimum. The figure on this slide shows an EMS provider accessing the patient. Always explain to the patient why you're there and what you're doing. Simple access is one thing you can determine easily and it should be your first step. Your first step is simple access, which is trying to get to the patient as quickly and simply as possible without using tools or breaking any glass. Automobiles are built for easy entry and exit. It, however, it may be necessary to use forceful entry methods. The rescue team should provide the entrance you need to gain access to the patient. If the rescue team has not yet arrived, Use tools like hammers, center punches, pry bars, and hacksaws. These should be available in the ambulance. And gain access by trying to use all door handles or rolling down the windows before breaking any windows or using any other methods of forced entry. Just do the you know path of least resistance. Try the doors first. Uh, 10 out of 12 times, you're going to be able to gain access through a door. Now, some modern vehicles have auto locking systems which may or may not disengage upon collision. So that's one thing to bear in mind. But older model cars um, don't always have power locks. So just try opening the door or any of the doors. Complex access requires special tools such as pneumatic and hydraulic devices. devices. And these require special training. It includes breaking windows or removing the roof of the car, and these advanced skills are typically formed by a specialized team, usually firefighters. The figure on this slide shows the extrication process. 
and this is a complex extrication and requires the use of pneumatic and or hydraulic devices. What you see the fire filing holder down here on the left are the pry bars. They can be called in uh, vernacular the jaws of life, but those are pneumatic pry bars. With emergency care, you want to provide medical care to a patient who's trapped in the vehicle and is essentially it's the same for any other patient. And once entrance and access to the patient have been provided and the scene is safe, perform your primary assessment and begin providing care before further extrication begins. Provide manual stabilization to protect the cervical spine as needed. Open the airway, provide high flow oxygen, assist or provide for adequate ventilation. Control any significant external bleeding, treat all critical injuries, and address life-threatening external hemorrhages before airway and breathing. When it comes to removal of the patient, rescue personnel should coordinate with you to determine the best removal route. Removal of a patient from a motor vehicle is a multi-step process that is intensive in terms of the number of rescue personnel involved, the equipment used, and effort required to prevent further injury or harm to the patient. This is table 38-2 in your book and this describes this vehicle extrication techniques for complex access. Um, there can be brake and gas pedal displacement which the fire department has tools for. It could involve dashboard roll-up, door removal, roof opening and removal, seat displacement, steering column displacement, and steering wheel cutting. You should participate in preparation for patient removal. Determine how urgently the patient must be extricated and determine where you should be positioned to best protect the patient. After the patient's been extricated, determine how you will move the patient from the backboard and then to the stretcher. Ex examine carefully any trapped patients or limbs of their patients to determine, to determine the extent of their injuries. If possible, evaluate a sensation in the trapped area. That's the sensation of their limbs, obviously. Your input is essential so that the rescue team plans an extrication that protects the patient from further harm. Reevaluate whether the patient needs rapid extrication. In most cases, it's impractical to apply extremity splints within a vehicle, and extremity injuries can be generally supported and immobilized while the patient's being removed. For example, you can secure a fractured arm to the patient's side, secure a fractured leg to the other leg. Once a plan's been devised, you should determine how best to protect the patient. Often you'll be placed in the vehicle alongside the patient. Be sure to wear proper protective equipment. Your safety and the patient's safety are paramount. Make sure you're wearing appropriate hearing protection because the pneumatic tools and saws that can be used at the scene, they're quite loud, especially the generators. Now let's talk about transfer of the patient. Perform a complete primary assessment once the patient has been freed and any other previously inaccessible patients have been freed. Make sure that the spine is manually stabilized and apply a cervical collar if this has not already been done. Move the patient in a series of smooth, slow, controlled steps with designated stops to allow for repositioning and readjustments. Position each EMT for a smooth, controlled transfer. Remember the person at the head's in control. Everyone should pay attention and work together as a unit. One person should be in charge of the move. Again, that's the person at the head, generally. So choose a path that requires the least manipulation of the patient and equipment. Ensure that everyone understands the steps and is ready. And move only when the team leader commands. That's the person at the head. Move the patient as a coordinated unit and continue to protect the patient from any hazards. Once the patient's been placed on a stretcher, continue with any additional assessment and treatment that was deferred because you couldn't access them, all of them previously. The figure on this slide shows the management of a patient during extrication process. Once the patient's been accessed, rapidly assess the patient, stabilize the spine manually, and apply a cervical collar if not already done. 
Termination involves returning emergency uh, units to service. All equipment used on the scene must be checked before reloading them on the apparatus. Check and clean the ambulance thoroughly, replacing used supplies. And rescue and medical units are required to complete all necessary reports. Specialized rescue situations. Sometimes a patient can be reached only by teams trained with special rescue techniques. The specialized skills of these teams include the following. A cave-in rescue or cave rescue, confined space rescue, cross-field and trail rescue, such as park rangers, dive rescue. Missing person search and rescue, mine rescue, mountain rock and ice climbing rescue, ski slope or cross-country trail snow rescue, those are ski patrol, and structural collapse rescue. You also have special teams such as special weapons and tactics or SWAT teams and technical re rope rescue, which is low and high angle rescue, trench rescue and water and small craft, res craft rescue and whitewater rescue. Now let's talk about technical rescue situations. A technical res rescue situation requires specialized skills and equipment to safely enter and move around. The situation may contain hidden dangers. It is not safe to include personnel who have not been trained. A technical rescue group is trained and on call for certain types of technical rescues. It's made up of individuals from one or more departments. And many members of technical rescue groups are also trained as emergency medical responders or EMTs, and sometimes they're paramedics as well. Check with the incident commander to make sure the technical rescue group has been summoned as and is en route. The incident commander is the individual who has overall command of the scene in the field. One member must clearly be in charge. A lack of identifiable leadership at a scene hinders the rescue effort and delays patient care. The incident commander's assessment will dictate how medical care, packaging, and transport will proceed, and customarily the senior medical person takes this role. If no incident commander is present, follow local guidelines. When you arrive at a technical rescue scene, you will be directed or led to the staging area. If the staging area is some distance from the ambulance, take a long backboard and or basket stretcher. Be sure to take off all the jump kits and other equipment that you may need to treat and immobilize the patient. And set up your equipment at the staging area, which is a stable location where you'll be able to treat the patient. Perform a primary assessment as soon as the rescue team brings the patient to you. Packaging and carrying the patient back to the ambulance requires a joint effort between EMTs and the technical rescue team. Consider using air medical unit if the patient will be need, needed to be carried or transported an extensive distance. With search and rescue, an ambulance is usually summoned to the incident command post when a person is lost outdoors or a search effort is initiated. Your role is to stand by at the command post until the missing person or persons have been found. As soon as you're briefed on the situation, isolate and prepare the equipment you may need to carry to the patient's location or staging area and leave the prepared equipment in the back of the ambulance to protect it from the weather. You may be asked to stay with family members of a lost individual. When doing so, gather any medical history and communicate to those in charge. Only the incident commander should communicate any news or progress of the search to the family. Set your radio at a discreet volume. Once the missing person is found, you'll be able to you'll be guided by search personnel to the location where you're allowed to begin treatment. Time and effort can sometimes be decreased by relocating the ambulance or by using an all-terrain vehicle. So ensure that equipment is evenly distributed among providers. Ensure that pace is maintained such that all can stay together easily. Trench rescue is rather unique, so let's talk about it for a minute. There are many cave-ins and trench collapses that have poor outcomes for victims. Collapses usually involve large areas of falling dirt that can weigh approximately 100 pounds per cubic foot. Victims with thousands of pounds of dirt on their chest cannot fully expand their lungs and may become hypoxic. The risk of a secondary collapse is always of concern to rescue personnel and EMTs. 
there are safety measures that can reduce the potential for injuries. Re response vehicles should be parked at least 500 feet from the scene. All vehicles should be turned off to avoid secondary collapse caused by vibration. And all road traffic should be diverted from the 500 foot safety area. Other hazards include potential downed electrical wires and broken glass or water lines. And in some areas, the electrical lines are buried, as are gas lines. So that's something to bear in mind as well. You also could have construction equipment at the scene and of collapse, and it may be unstable and could potentially fall into the cave-in or trench site. Witnesses to the incident should be identified. They may be valuable in providing information on the number of victims and their locations. Assist non-trapped individuals from the area. At no time should medical or rescue personnel enter a trench deeper than four feet without proper shoring in place. During the extrication of any survivors, medical personnel trained in cave-in and trench collapse rescue will provide the most medical care. Once you're prepared to receive patients when they've been extricated from a site, be ready for that. Now let's talk about tactical emergency medical support. A steady increase in violence throughout the country has resulted in EMTs taking precautions to ensure medical or personal safety. Normally, when potential for violence exists, responding units should wait until the scene is secured by law enforcement officers. Sometimes a special weapons and tactics or SWAT team is needed to secure an area. There can be hostage incidents or barricaded subjects, snipers, and many communities have incorporated specifically trained or specially trained EMTs, paramedics, nurses, and even physicians into police SWAT units. These are there to provide a special level of care to the sick and injured, and their training goes well beyond the practices seen in standard emergency medical care. When called to the scene of a law enforcement tactical situation, determine the location of the command post and report to the incident commander for instructions. Lights and sirens should be turned off and outside radio speakers should not be used when nearing the scene. The command post is usually located in an area that cannot be seen by the suspect. It's usually out of range of possible gunfire, so make sure to remain in this area. Planning measures are key in these situations. Have the incident commander identify a specific location of the incident. The incident commander should determine a safe location to meet up with SWAT members if an injury occurs and determine a safe route to this point. Designate primary and secondary helicopter landing zones if your region uses aeromedical evaluation, evacuation. Excuse me. The quickest route to the closest hospital, burn center, or trauma center should be identified, and it should be already well known before you arrive at such a situation. Now let's talk about structure fires. In most areas, an ambulance is dispatched with the fire department to any structure fire. A fire in a house or other building is considered a structure fire. Determine whether any special route is needed because of the fire. Ask the incident commander where the ambulance should be staged. The ambulance should be far enough away from the fire to be safe. It cannot block or hinder arriving equipment. It cannot be blocked in and it should be close enough and visible so patients can be brought to it easily by firefighters. Determine if there are inj any injured patients or whether you've been called to stand by. A number of ambulances may be dispatched to a scene, depending on the size and scale of the scene. Search and rescue in a burning building requires special training and equipment. These operations are performed by teams of firefighters wearing full turnout gear and self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA. They carry tools and hose lines and these teams will bring patients out of a burning building to the area where the ambulance is staged. Stay with the ambulance unless otherwise instructed. After the fire is out, do not leave the scene because you may have to treat an injured firefighter. The ambulance should leave only if transporting a patient or if the incident commander has released it. Sometimes the scene may be further complicated by the presence of hazardous materials. Hazardous materials pose a threat to you and others at the scene, as well as much larger area and a population. So follow additional procedures that are outlined in Chapter 39, Incident Management. Okay, let's go through the review questions. Number one, proper protective equipment will vary depending on the hazards encountered. 
which piece of equipment should be utilized during all patient contacts. A, turnout gear, B, helmets, C, blood and fluid impermeable gloves, and D, goggles. This one should be very easy. It is C. The importance of wearing blood and fluid impermeable gloves at all times during a patient contact cannot be emphasized enough. If you're involved with extrication, you should wear a pair of leather gloves over your disposable gloves, and you should potentially also double glove, depending on how much glass and how much sharp stuff is around and how much blood or body fluid uh, may be available at, uh, at a scene. So consider double gloving as well. Let's go over the other equipment or other answers. Uh, a turnout gear, this equipment is important, but it's not necessary for every patient encounter. So that's not a correct answer. Helmets and that equipment it also is important, but again, not necessary for every patient encounter. C, the correct answer, blood and fluid impermeable gloves. And D, goggles. Uh, this equipment is also important, but again, not necessary for every patient encounter. So gloves are always your first line of defense. What is the first phase of extrication? Arrival, preparation, scene size up, or gaining access? It is B. There are 10 phases of the extrication. If you remember that slide I showed to you, preparation is the first. Preparing for an incident requiring extrication involves training for the various types of rescue training situations that your team might face. Just as you must check the equipment on the ambulance, Rescue personnel must routinely check extrication tools and their response vehicles to ensure proper operation. Preparation reduces the possibility of equipment failure at a scene. Again, let's review the incorrect answers. What is the first phase of extrication? A. Arrival. This is part of the third phase of extrication. B. Preparation is the correct answer. C, scene size up. This is part of the third phase of extrication. And gaining access, this is the sixth phase of extrication. So make sure you're aware of the steps, all of those steps that are necessary in extrication. Number three, as you approach an unconscious patient who's still in a wrecked vehicle, you note there is a power line entangled in the wreckage of the vehicle. You should A, retreat until the power's been removed or the power's shut off. B, carefully gain access to the patient without touching any metal objects. C, don a pair of rubber gloves and carefully disentangle and remove the power line. Or D, call for a tow truck to lift the vehicle off the power line and then gain access to the patient. This one should be easy if you just use common sense. It is A, never attempt to gain access to a patient until you're certain the vehicle is stable and any hazards have been identified and removed. Common hazards at a motor vehicle crash include leaking gasoline, power lines over the vehicle, and engine fires. And sometimes they're there together. Here the answer is obvious. The rationale is never attempt to access a patient until you're certain that the vehicle is stable and until you're certain that the vehicle is any hazards have been identified and removed. And common hazards at a motor vehicle crash include leaking gasoline, power lines over the vehicle, and engine fires. And one thing to remember is that the patient, while they're in the vehicle, and all four rubber tires are on the ground, the car is grounded. So that's the safest place for them to be. And the safest place for you to be is away from them, especially if the car is potentially leaking fuel, which you want to get in there and help them, but remember the situation that you're in. Let's look at the incorrect answers. Uh, as you approach an unconscious patient who's still in the wrecked vehicle, you note there's a power line entangled in the wreckage of the vehicle. You should A, retreat till the power line's been removed or power is shut off. That is again the correct answer. B, carefully gain access to the patient without touching metal objects. Again, never attempt to gain access to a patient until all hazards, not just power lines, have been removed. All hazards. Uh, C, don a pair of rubber gloves and carefully disentangle and remove the power line. Again, that should be done by experts in the power industry, typically electricity company personnel. Those lines are charged and as soon as you grab onto it, you're grounded and you're cooked. So do not ever try to touch a power line. 
and D call for a tow truck to lift the vehicle off the power line and then access the patient. Again here, accessing the vehicle before electrical hazard has been removed can and will, I emphasize will, result in additional injuries. Let's look at number four. A two passenger car struck a tree while driving approximately 50 miles an hour. The doors are badly damaged and jammed and the driver appears to be unconscious inside the vehicle. Entering the vehicle by breaking the back window is an example of A, simple access, B, complex access, C, technical rescue, or D, disentanglement. This, if you think about it logically, you should be able to get the correct answer. And it's B, complex access requires the use of special tools and special training, including breaking windows or other forcible entry. Simple access does not involve the use of any tools. That's just like opening the car door. Examples of simple access are opening a car door or rolling down a window or having the patient roll down the window. Sometimes they still can, so it's worth a try. Let's look at the incorrect answers. Um, simple access does not involve the use of any tools, which here, if you're having to bust out the rear window, that's complex answer, and that's B. That's the correct answer. C, technical rescue. Technical rescue involves the use of a very specialized teams, and D, disentanglement. That's not the correct answer because that involves the removal of the vehicle from around the patient. Number five, a 30-year-old semi-conscious man is pinned by the steering wheel of his badly wrecked vehicle. Once access has been gained to the patient, the EMT should A, have the fire department disentangle the patient and quickly remove him from the vehicle, B, immediately apply high flow oxygen to the patient and then allow extrication to begin, C, perform a primary assessment and provide it any needed emergency care prior to extrication, or D, ensure that the patient is not bleeding significantly before allowing the extrication process to commence. This one you have to think about a little bit, but I'm sure you'll get the correct answer, so let's see what it is. It is C. Unless there's an immediate threat of fire, explosion, or other danger, you should perform a primary assessment and treat all immediate life threats as soon as you've gained access to the patient. After correcting any immediately life-threatening problems, then the technical teams can begin extrication. Let's look at the incorrect answers. A. Have the fire department disentangle the patient and remove him from the vehicle. This should only be done after correcting immediately life threats to the patient. B. Immediately apply fly flow oxygen to the patient and then allow extrication to begin. Oxygen may be applied, but First, all life threats must be assessed and treated prior to extrication. And I need to footnote that by saying, remember that oxygen is or an oxidizer. Fuel uses oxygen or fire uses oxygen as fuel. So if there's a potential that there's uh, going to be saws or any kind of tools that are going to spark uh, that may uh, require be required for extrication, oxygen doesn't need to be on the scene. C, perform primary assessment and provide needed emergency care prior to extrication. That, again, is the correct answer. And D, assure the patient's not bleeding significantly before allowing the extrication process to commence. Remember that bleeding's not the only immediate life threat. You've also got airway and breathing, and those need to be assessed as well. So that's why D is partially correct, but C is the most correct answer. Number six, while the EMT is in a vehicle assessing a patient. The rescue team should be A, assessing exactly how the patient's trapped and determining the safest way to extricate, B, awaiting further instructions from the EMT regarding how to proceed with extrication, C, actively extricating the patient using whichever rescue method is deemed necessary by the rescue leader, or D, preparing for a simple extrication process as the EMT has obviously gained patient access. The correct answer is A. While the patient's being assessed, the rescue team should be assessing the degree of entrapment and determining the safe, safest and easiest way to extricate. Once the assessment of the patient is complete, the extrication can commence. Let's look at the incorrect answers. So we determined A is the correct answer. B, awaiting further instructions aware, uh, from the EMT regarding how to proceed with the extrication. Although the EMT may verbalize the patient's injuries, which may help in deciding how the extrication can best be handled, the actual extrication is performed by the rescue team. 
So really the EMT is, is passing along information. C, actively extricating the patient using whichever rescue method is deemed necessary by the rescue leader. The decision on extrication method must include the assessment of the patient, the degree of entrapment, and determination of the safest extrication route. And usually that's going to require a specifically trained rescue team. Um, you know, especially depending on the severity of the incident you're involved in. And D, preparing for a simple extrication process as the EMT has obviously gained access to the patient. Well, the rescue team leader must consider all options. The way the EMT came in may not be the best way to get the patient out. Just because the EMT can get in doesn't mean you can get the patient easily out. Uh, they're not mobile and uh, they may have injuries, they may be unconscious, they may have spinal injuries, so that's definitely why that answer is not correct. Number seven, proper removal of a critically injured patient from an automobile involves A, moving the patient in one fast continuous step, B, utilizing no more than two personnel to avoid crowding, C, moving the patient in smooth, slow, controlled steps, or D, removing the patient by grasping the immobilization device. This one, if you read it carefully, you should get the correct answer. It is C. To ensure that each rescue is positioned so that he or she can lift and properly carry the patient at all times, move the patient in a series of smooth, slow, controlled steps with stops designated in between to allow for repositioning or adjustments as needed. And that's not just the patient, that's also personnel. Move the patient as a unit and resist the temptation to move the immobilization device instead. Let's look at the incorrect answers. Uh, A, moving the patient in one fast continuous step. Again, that's incorrect. The removal should be smooth and slow. B, utilizing no more than two personnel to avoid crowding. The bottom line is you're going to have to use the number of rescuers necessary to allow for smooth and controlled removal. And that may be a lot of people. So that's incorrect. C, move the patient in smooth, controlled steps. Again, that's the correct answer. And D, removing the patient by grasping the immobilization device. Do not grab or pull the immobilization devices. This will prevent loosening or dislodging the devices. And the patient can um, slip from uh, underneath them, maybe not entirely out, but it, they can slip or move underneath these devices if you pull just the device and not the patient and that can cause further injury. Question eight, a man has been sucked inside the bin of a grain silo and is trapped. Which of the rest, which of the following rescue teams is the most appropriate to request? A, trench rescue, B, high angle rescue, C, the local fire department, or D, confined space rescue? Let's look at the correct answer. It would be D. Of the technical rescue teams listed, a confined rescue team would be the most appropriate to request for help. Grain silos are confined spaces that such teams are specially trained to operate in. Trench rescue teams are trained to deal with cave-ins and trench collapses. If your local fire department is confined or trained in confined space rescue, they should be notified. And there's an additional hazard with grain silos. That is that grain and flour and things like that the dust is highly explosive so they are specially recognized and trained teams to deal with that kind of special rescue it's not only confined space but there's a potential explosion hazard as well let's look at the incorrect answers um trench rescue again that's not appropriate because they're trained for rescues from trench cave-ins high angle rescues that's not appropriate because they're trained for rescues on slopes greater than 45 degrees, which obviously the opening of a grain elevator is not, or a grain silo is not going to, to be. See your local fire department. Um, they may or may not be trained in confined space rescue. It's a specialized training course. So D, you need a team specifically trained in confined space rescue. That's the correct answer. Number nine, you respond to a wooded area to help search for a child who's been missing for approximately 24 hours. Which of the following equipment should you leave in the ambulance? A, radio, B, flashlight, C, jump kit, or D, backboard. This one should be quite easy. It's D. When participating in a search and rescue effort, 
large equipment that's not easily carried, like a backboard, wheeled stretcher, etc., should be left in the ambulance? Let's look at the incorrect answers. Radio. Um, communications via radio in a search and rescue mission is extremely important, so obviously you have to have it. B is incorrect. Flashlight, you have to involve uh, possibility of low light conditions, and that requires flashlight, or you may be losing light. So, or um, it can be broad daylight, but the area you're searching is heavily shadowed, so always have a flashlight. C, jump kit, that's necessary for initial treatment of life threatening conditions in and with, in and when the victim is found. So, that you should have with you. So, D is the correct answer. Leave backboard and large equipment in the ambulance. Take your jump kit, radio, and flashlight. Those are your, you're definitely going to need. Question 10. You're dispatched to the scene of a trench collapse. Upon arriving at the scene, your ambulance should be parked at least how many feet from the incident? A250, B500, C750, or D1000? If you remember what we just went over not too long ago, you should get this one. It is B. When arriving at the scene of a cave-in or trench collapse, response vehicles should be parked at least 500 feet from the scene. Because vibration is a primary cause of secondary collapse, all vehicles, including on-scene construction equipment, should be turned off. In addition, all traffic should be diverted from the 500-foot safety area. I'm not going to review the other um, answers because we already know that 500 feet is the only correct answer here. Again, I'm not going to review these because, as you can see, 500 feet is the correct answer uh, for trench collapse. Thank you for your time and attention, as always, and make sure to review the slides that were in this lecture that are also in your text. Make sure you review steps of extrication. If you have any questions, please refer to your instruction, instructor for further instruction. And as always, again, thank you for your time and attention, and we'll see you next class.